James Bond is just one of the famous names associated with British sports car legend Aston Martin. Designing for celebrities like 007 is a challenge superbly mastered by Sarah Maynard, a former fashion designer. And I just thought, hey, you know, this, is, this could be fun. This is something very, very different. Um, lots of boys, fast cars, no one tells you those things at college. Sarah Maynard walked away from fashion to enter the world of fast cars in 2001. She redesigned the interior for the new Aston Martin DB9 and gave the dashboard a complete makeover. The first uh, um, assignment was um, for me on, on the James uh, Bond car um, where we had uh, before a red plastic engine start which was pad printed and it just seemed so wrong for, for A for James Bond um, but B for any of our customers um, that the first point of contact um, had to be something very, very special. So she got on the phone to a jeweler friend who usually designs for Paris fashion shows. Together they drew up a starter button made of cut glass, just one of the refined new features of the DB9. Aston Martin has a long tradition. The company moved to a new site in Gaydon, south of Birmingham, in 2003. The history of the company goes back to 1913. It first became renowned for its racing cars and exclusive sports models before becoming a household name in 1964 when James Bond drove an Aston Martin in the film Goldfinger. Sean Connery was the first to take the wheel of an Aston Martin on Her Majesty's service. Pierce Brosnan drove one in a more recent Bond film, just one of many satisfied customers. He's just one of our customers. <laughs> Maynard trained as a fashion and textile designer and ran her own company in Paris for over four years, designing and producing clothes for top labels. She did furniture and interior design work until she changed direction and headed for the car industry. For me, design is like always learning, always wanting new challenges, new things. And um, I found it quite exciting and quite a challenge of working on a vehicle which is quite compact, quite small, with a huge amount of design um, input into it and, and learning so much. And when you're working with a large company, you've got access to a huge, as I call it, like almost like a playground of materials. Recently, though, she's returned to the fashion business, developing accessories to complement the interior design of the car. It took her and her team two years to complete the collection with new colors, shapes, and materials. Women are still a bit of a rarity in the world of car design. It is quite unusual, but I'd probably prefer, rather than just necessarily being a gender thing, um, that it... I have come from a different background, which I think automatically then puts on a, maybe a different slant and a different way of looking at things. Um, but um, I wouldn't necessarily say that's necessarily a boy-girl thing. Her philosophy as a designer is straightforward but ambitious. And my ultimate aim, um, hopefully, is to be able to produce something which is ultimately timeless, which will hopefully then be a classic. There's no doubt about it, Sarah Maynard is a designer who's opened the door to success. Anna Torf's glassware is simple, minimalistic even. Her exclusive collection of vases comprises some 30 models in vibrant colors. The Belgian-born designer has worked in Prague for over 10 years. In 2002, she founded her own highly successful Anna Torfs brand and now sells her glassware around the globe. Working with glass is very special, very frustrating and uh... You always get surprises because there's many facets on the production. First you blow the glass and, and in fact everything's really made by hand. 
and uh, shapes never come out the way you want them to come out but sometimes even better than you could have anticipated so that's also very nice sometimes Every piece is unique and comes with her signature. Anna Torf's vases are blown in small series or limited edition. Prices, depending on size and effort involved, vary between 50 and 1500 euros. Each one is a creative experiment in glass. I wanted to accentuate the center, so I wanted to make little cracks in the center. But when we did that, when we made the little cracks, then you put hot glass around it again and then suddenly it all became bubbles, but in a very uh, intense way. The Ayeto glass foundry in the northwest of the Czech Republic specializes in individual artistic creations and complex production. A team of designers and glass blowers work together closely to get the desired results. The glowing hot glass is drawn out layer by layer, constantly turned and polished, until finally the work of art is complete. It's really specialized on the fact that there's a lot of foreign artists coming here to realize their new designs, which means that each team is uh, very open to new ideas, which is very nice because when you come and you want to experiment, you want to try new techniques, this is possible, which is quite unique, I think. Anna Torfs came to Prague from Brussels 15 years ago. After studying interior design, she took a postgraduate course in set design. There she developed a fascination for the creative potential of Czech artisans and decided to produce her own glass line. Now 38, she's numbered amongst the best known glass designers in the Czech Republic. I'm sure that the fact that glass is made here has influenced me and has made me interested in trying to work with it. Yes, definitely. Anna Torfs has made several total career changes, moving from dance to interior design, from set design, then back to design. The many layers of her experience are reflected in her glass creations. That's a little bit the theme of my work, you know, like to add different layers, to cover things up and then to cut them open and show them again. In fact, yeah. Anna Torfs believes in focusing entirely on her subject. She believes there's nothing you can't illustrate or express in glass. Which is why she's soon heading to Murano, the center of Italy's glass production, in search of new inspiration. These floating villas can be up to a hundred meters long. The tailor-made giants get bigger and more luxurious by the year. 50 million euros for one of these mega monsters at the Monaco Yacht Show? No problem. But the buyers prize discretion. Only a few would talk to us. We're also looking for some nice design, which is also well advertised here, well performed here. So uh, we're looking for something new something interesting. More than 90 super yachts crowd Monaco's Port Hercules Harbour. Shipbuilders, brokers and designers from more than 38 countries do big business here. Like architect Ken Frivok from England, who's been coming here for 15 years. An award-winning yacht designer, he knows all the latest trends. You will notice a number of the yachts now are painted with metallic silver, black, uh, the details externally are that much special. They have to draw attention and show their quality and go that one step further. Ken Frivok loves the challenge of fulfilling outlandish wishes. He designed both the exterior and interior of this 35 meter long catamaran. It's a unique model. Frivok has been creating floating palaces for over 20 years. His wealthy customers give him free reign to play with costly materials and sophisticated technology. All the yachts are like living cities. Uh, they generate their own water, their own electricity, their own temperature. Uh, the materials have to comply with a number of, of regulations and have to withstand the, the rigorous uh, life at sea. And that is all the challenge that we very much enjoy 
and that we, we find gives, gives us uh, a reason for, for continuing uh, lovely work. He's tucked away a lot of high-tech material in the teakwood furniture. The stairs are made of ultra-lightweight carbon fiber composite. Ken's Spirit is more stable than most super yachts. It's broader, lighter, and faster. This futuristic luxury vessel costs 15 million euros. This year's show features 35 new models. It's not always easy for brokers to find buyers for them right away. When you introduce something new, a uh, new concept, new design, that's like a little bit more time. You know, it's like the new style of villas or cars. It's not immediately. You ha yes, of course, you can find some very interesting clients. They just to see the boats and in, a, well, in two or three weeks, they decide to take it. Buyers of these mega pleasure boats may already have a yacht or two, country mansions, luxury cars, but still, they come to the Monaco Yacht Show looking for that unique something that no one else has. Italian shipbuilder Bonetti is the world's leading maker of luxury motor yachts. Every detail is custom made. A 43 meter long dream in cherry wood, all according to the customer's wishes. Whether it's solid luxury like Bonetti's or futuristic elegance like Ken Freevox designs, at the Monaco Yacht Show, there's something for everyone with the cash to spare. If you only go to one show, this is a show. And that's not just because of the profitable deals. There's also the after-show parties. On the dot of six, Ken Freevok and all the other yacht lovers hasten from one cocktail reception to the next. This time, the weather hasn't been quite up to scratch, but that hasn't spoiled the mood of the Monaco Yacht Show. Most of this year's floating mansions are sure to find a new owner. It's all a trick of the light. And it's all down to Thomas Emde, one of the first artists in Germany to cast cities in a good light. For three years now, he's been working on a comprehensive lighting concept for Frankfurt's financial district. I'm fascinated by light as a material because it's such an ancient theme. The campfire, the stars, the glittering sea. We would all like to look upon the divine light, namely the sun, but then we'd no longer be of this world, we'd be burnt up. And light is really a very recent artistic medium, maybe three, four or five years old. Previously, light was utilitarian. His largest scale project so far is beamed over the rooftops of Frankfurt. The Kommerzbank building, Europe's highest skyscraper at 300 meters. Thomas Emde is setting new architectural standards across Germany with his lighting creations for shopping malls, museums and banks. He realizes his ideas in tandem with lighting technicians and graphic artists. The first time we used LED glass on the facade of a building was at the Barbarossa Center in Cologne. The glass isn't lit from within, the panels are self-illuminated. And they were developed by Emde himself. Light-emitting diodes on the edges of the glass panel feed light in. Small imprinted dots guide it away and out of the panel. The color and brightness of the LED glass are infinitely variable. There are 16.5 million possible colors to choose from, just like on a video monitor. One thing that inspired me to use self-illuminating glass, or rather develop it into a truly viable product, was a train journey from Frankfurt to Kassel. The train traveled into a tunnel, out of it, and in and out again. Daylight came in from the side, then artificial light from above, and I thought, why doesn't the window pane itself shed light? We build our homes and offices to make maximum use of daylight. And when it gets dark in the evening, we rely on artificial light. LED windows instead of standard lamps, Thomas Emde's visions have generated huge interest. In addition to his studio, the artist has founded his own company to focus entirely on the LED projects. His first coup using this new material was illuminated pieces of furniture, developed together with four architects. For relaxing moments with a difference, 
How about this designer hammock with glowing canopy? We color our furniture either blue or black or red or white, but using LED technology means I can quickly bring the pieces in line with my emotions, according to what mood I'm in. In the kitchen, for example, when I'm eating, I've got some Italian food with red wine or a grappa, and I can create a whole range of moods for myself. Living in bare rooms, abstract with no fixed features, open plan with a fresh design. The ideal house for the doyen of German designers, Dieter Rams. Rams has been working for 50 years. Now he's competing against the new generation at the Cologne Furniture Fair, pitting his ideas for the perfect living room against concepts put forward by three newcomers. Classic against modern, old versus young. Rams always emphasizes function. I'm not the youngest anymore. If I buy a laptop, then I expect it to be self-explanatory. It could be. Sometimes it's just a matter of hitting the one right key. So tell me what to do. I could do that. I could if the software taught me how. This brown radio, which came out in the 60s, is a classic Dieter Rams design. The Rams shelving units were designed 46 years ago in 1960. They're so simple and functional that they took this year's Cologne Furniture Prize for the best design. Less, but better. That's something people should take to heart more. Really. To say at some point, okay, that's enough. It isn't always necessary to create something new, but it is necessary to make things better. They're young and they see things in their own way. Up and coming European designers alongside Dieter Rams. They presented their ideas to hundreds of journalists. Different ideas about lifestyles from two generations. Astrid Krog from Denmark is an independent production and textile designer. Her dream house has mobile walls made of hundreds of slats and virtually no furniture, emphasizing space in an overcrowded world. Fewer possessions create greater calm. I get tired very quickly. I, it's, it's like being on a museum. When I'm visiting a museum, I normally only see one or two paintings and then I'm out again because I cannot have more in my head. I'm just, yeah, that's it. I think it's different. <laughs> Stefan Dietz from Munich is a young designer for the Rosenthal Porcelain Company. And he considers himself both a furniture and production designer because he thinks the two are inseparable. As he points out, design these days is more complex than 40 years ago because everything already exists. There's no longer room for rebellion. Breaking taboos is no longer fashionable. We're no longer concerned with throwing off some sort of burden. Our real problem is the freedom we now have and how to handle it. His sofa is a car. Joris Larman from the Netherlands believes in totally free design. An inflatable boat as a bath. A radiator adorned with flourishes. It's an abstraction of the way that I like to live. I, it's my ideal house. It's not, maybe it's not your ideal house, but if you like it, you could pick up pieces that are interesting for you. The master of the simple matched against three newcomers. They've all copied each other's ideas, relying on mutual inspiration. More than 40 years professional experience separate the star and the new designers. But then every generation reinvents the ideal living room. Art Nouveau tiles adorn most apartment buildings in Berlin built around the end of the 19th century. That makes them valuable. 
collectors can pay around 60 euros for a single tile, and they're an attractive target for thieves as well. So there's always a demand for replacements. That's where Thomas Cimic and his firm Golem Ceramics comes in. Authenticity is difficult. It's important not to create your own Art Nouveau-like designs, but to exactly reproduce the originals. You can't simply make copies. You first have to enlarge the original designs, and you have to produce them in ways that make economic sense. Golem's tiles are all made by hand, which makes them labor-intensive. Once the original design has been captured, it goes into the press. Nine tons of pressure per square centimeter are needed to print the design on the raw tiles. The tiles are then painted and glazed. Experienced tile makers can produce around 60 tiles a day, and they seem to enjoy their work. I think this Adam is really lovely. He's got a nice aura. He's always smiling, and that makes me smile. <laughs> Over a thousand differently designed tiles were produced in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was a break from the sober style of the preceding decades. But Golem Ceramics doesn't have a problem with the variety of tiles they're called upon to reproduce. Even experts have trouble telling the reproductions from the originals. You can see that a tile has been installed here. This is an original. There's a slight difference in color, but it's not all that apparent. Because the new ones have a different design, that's what you notice, not small differences in color. The work of Golem Ceramics also adorns a church in Eberswalde, a public bath in Hamburg, a cathedral in Vienna, and ceramic floors at Berlin's main Jewish cemetery. Their most prestigious project was restoration work in Berlin's Hackische Höfe, a massive labyrinth of industrial courtyards which have been turned into an arcade for restaurants and boutiques. That's where the company's headquarters is located as well. The firm gets a lot of private customers interested in buying its products. We saw these Art Nouveau tiles on the internet. We've seen originals from this series, but the ones we saw here are exactly what we were looking for. Golem's reproductions aren't cheap. A single tile costs between 17 and 20 euros. But business is good. Things are going great. People come in and are impressed by the tiles. A lot of them decide in the end to use our products to tile their foyers, halls and kitchens. The name Golem comes from a legend about a rabbi who formed a tiny creature from a lump of clay to help people around their homes. Now Thomas Jimmick's company is helping others decorate theirs. Louise Campbell loves turning things on their heads, playing around with them, and questioning their functions. That's how the Danish designer creates her objects. Objects like Seesaw, an award-winning creation designed to make waiting rooms fun. I've designed many nests actually many of my one-off chairs and nests that you cradle yourself in and i work with rhythm movement to comfort you and things that are gentle to the touch i'm trying to work with the senses louise campbell spends a great deal of her time trying out her ideas in her copenhagen apartment she's a real perfectionist who never takes shortcuts she says design shouldn't just be eye-catching but also have a very special functionality I never know exactly what I'm doing before I start, but uh, you give me a challenge of uh, making a chair for a specific person, for example, I'll put personality into the chair. If you ask me to design a storage unit for clothes, I'll rethink it. It won't be square and it won't have perfect shelves and it won't have a door you can close. I'll probably expose your clothes instead. So I'm twisting things, but very discreetly, very small twists. 
The Danish designer likes to combine conventional materials in unconventional ways, like these steel and wool recliners. Indeed, her secret to success is crossing traditional boundaries. It's not a normal life because I'm distant. My mind is always elsewhere. I'm training not to be like this, but yes, my mind is always elsewhere. I'm using all my impressions, abusing them by taking them into my work somehow. Louise Campbell is famous for her trend-setting styles in her native Denmark, and her products are in great demand. The designer is always on the lookout for new challenges, experimenting with unusual materials. Her energetic creativity seems to know no bounds. I push it to I push it further than we all thought it could go and I stop when it makes sense to the design. And that's always, you know, it's it's a very abstract thing to talk about because occasionally I want the plastic to be as fat and heavy as possible as in the lamps. And in other situations I want the plastic to be as light and thin as possible. It depends on what I'm trying to achieve with the material. Louise Campbell has won a large number of international designer awards for her experimental creativity with steel, plastic, and especially felt. I had a dream to be free to do things the way I wanted to do it. And that has come true. This is how I work now. I do things my own way. And if I am allowed to continue working this way, then I'm a very content person. Louise Campbell, the emotional yet no-nonsense designer, is a national treasure for Denmark. A treasure that's certainly soon to go international too.